choices. All right, look with me in Romans 15, starting in verse 20. Hope when things don't go as planned. Hope when things don't go as planned. Paul says in Romans 15, verse 20, it has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Now, there's nothing wrong with building on someone else's foundation. That just wasn't Paul's call. Paul was called to be a pioneer. Verse 21, rather as it is written, those who were not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. This is why I have often been hindered from coming to you. But now there is no place left for me to work in these regions. And since I've been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to see you while passing through and have you assist me on my journey there after I've enjoyed your company for a while. Now, however, I'm on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the Lord's people there. For Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings." So after I have completed this task and have made sure that they have received this contribution, I will go to Spain and I will visit you on the way. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. I want you to hold on to those words because we're going to talk about the significance. I know when I come, I'll come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Holy Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be kept safe from the unbelievers in Judea and that the contribution I take to Jerusalem may be favorably received by the Lord's people there so that I might come to you with joy by God's will and in your company be refreshed. The God of peace be with you all. Amen. All right, let's just give thanks as we share the word. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your presence here. Lord, I pray that we would encounter you through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees, would you say amen and amen. In the summer of 1995, there was a bombing in Oklahoma City. It hit especially close to Denise and I, because we were living in southwest Missouri at the time, about an hour away from Oklahoma. The Alfred Murrah Federal Building was bombed by a homegrown terrorist. The bomb killed 168 people. It wounded 850 people. Among many of the victims, you'll remember, were infants and toddlers in a daycare. 324 buildings and a 16-block radius were either destroyed or damaged by that bomb. But just a few hundred feet away from where Timothy McVeigh detonated the truck bomb stood an ancient elm tree. Pictures of the tree in the city archives go back to the 1920s. The bomb blast stripped all the leaves off the tree. The, the tree was surrounded by 86 parked cars that all burned, and the bark on the tree was black and charred. Debris from the building that collapsed broke off branches. No one expected the tree to live. But in all the chaos and, uh, of the demolition and the cleanup, no one got around to cutting it down. And the next spring, something unexpected happened. The tree budded and it blossomed and it put forth new leaves. They nicknamed it the survivor's tree. And it became a symbol of hope for the survivors and for the families of the fallen. Today it's the centerpiece of the Memorial Park in Oklahoma City. And maybe it can be a symbol of hope for us today as well. We've been studying the ministry of Paul since 2012. We've been studying his letters together since 2014. And one of the things that stands out to be most about Paul is his unquenchable hopefulness. Paul's letters are full of hope. And Romans chapter 15 is full of hope. It is a chapter of hope. Paul is hopeful 
about his plans to travel to Rome and then on to Spain, which was the furthest frontier of the empire. He's hopeful that his visit first to Jerusalem will go smoothly and quickly. He's hopeful that he'll arrive in Rome with joy. He's hopeful that his stay in Rome will be brief and refreshing. He's hopeful that the Romans will provide him with funds and companions to go onward to Spain. Paul's words here at the end of Romans 15 are so ironic, it's almost comical. Because if you know how the story actually played out, nothing at all happened the way Paul imagined. In fact, everything happened almost precisely opposite of what Paul planned. Paul planned to travel from Greece to Rome quickly, but instead he was delayed for four years in Corinth trying to clean up messes in the church. He, he planned on a peacemaking mission to Jerusalem, but instead he was uh, 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 mobbed by a group of people. He was uh, arrested in Jerusalem to spare his life from an assassination plot. He was transferred the, to the city of Caesarea where the crooked governor Felix held him in prison for two years. When Felix's term was finished, he left his office and he left Paul rotting in jail. He left Governor Festus in charge and Festus was a political novice and the Jews tried to trick Festus into sending Paul back to Jerusalem so that they could kill him. So Paul had to appeal to Caesar to save his life. Just two days later, King Agrippa arrived in Caesarea and he said, oh, if only Paul hadn't appealed to Caesar, we could have set him free. It was a, a comedy of errors. It seemed as if Paul went out of the frying pan and into the fire. Paul planned on arriving in Rome with joy, but instead he arrived in chains on a prison transport ship ever spend a year in close quarters with soldiers and sailors and cellmates? Oh, what joy. <laughs> on the journey, Paul was shipwrecked during a terrifying hurricane. He was washed up on an island shore where he was bitten by a venomous snake. It was not a joyful trip. Paul planned on a short, refreshing visit to Rome where he would get financial help to go to Spain, but instead he rem remained under house arrest for two years in a house that he had to pay for by sewing tents. His plan was Jerusalem, then quickly to Rome, and then onward to Spain. But, but the whole journey took nine very difficult years. And yet, what I want you to see this morning is that Paul never let go of hope. As we think about that, I, I wonder if there is anyone else who can relate to Paul. I wonder if anyone else has had a few things in your life that didn't go quite like you planned it. Anyone have a relationship that didn't go like you planned? You thought you found a winner, but you got a chicken dinner? <laughs> Anyone have a career move that didn't go like you planned? Anyone made a financial decision that didn't go like you planned? Maybe your health took a turn that you didn't plan on. Maybe your kids' lives took a turn that you didn't plan on. Maybe you answered a call to ministry and it didn't go like you planned. Maybe you know, like Paul, what it is to get caught up in a comedy of errors. Maybe you know what it is to get out of the frying pan only to find yourself in the midst of the fire. How do we hold on to hope when things don't go as planned? Looking at Paul's stories, I find a few principles and I want to share them with you quickly this morning. How do we hold on to hope when things don't go as planned? First of all, when things don't go as planned, don't flee from your present problems and responsibilities. Anybody ever just wish you could fly away? <laughs> David certainly did. David wrote in Psalm 55, I wish I had the wings of a dove. I would fly far away. I, I would go hide in the desert and be at rest. This was David, the mighty warrior, the great king, the man after God's own heart, and he wanted to quit. And we know what that feels like too. 
on the Damascus road, Jesus knocked Paul off of his high horse. And he called Paul to become the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul went into the Arabian desert and he searched the scriptures. And from the scriptures, the Holy Spirit gave him a plan. Paul understood from the Old Testament scriptures that Gentiles from every tongue and tribe and nation were called to belong to the salvation that was bought by Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. So Paul made a plan to travel all the way around the northern arc of the Mediterranean Sea, taking the name of Jesus to the furthest ends of the earth. Rome was about halfway across that arc. Spain was all the way at the far end. But things didn't go exactly as Paul planned. In Romans 15, 25 years have gone by and Paul has only made it a quarter of the way around the ark. And the clock was ticking. Paul was already well into his 50s. He had a bit of a slow start. He spent three years in the desert and then he went back to Damascus and tried to preach the gospel and the Jews there tried to kill him. They lowered him over the city wall in a basket at night and he escaped to Jerusalem. When he got to Jerusalem, he tried to preach Christ there and the Jews there tried to kill him. The church was terrified of him, but they whisked him down to the seacoast and they put him on a ship for his home city of Tarsus in Syria and Paul spent 10 years there sewing tents trying to preach the gospel on weekends, but not getting very far. Thirteen years after Jesus had called Paul, it didn't look like Paul's ministry was going to amount to anything. I have to tell you the truth. If I were looking at Paul's resume, I would not hire him. (laughs) I'd figure anyone who hadn't accomplished anything in 13 years probably never would. Aren't you so glad that God looks at us through a completely different set of eyes? The world says it's over for you, but God says, oh no, it hasn't even begun. Finally, Barnabas went on a manhunt for Paul and he invited Paul to come minister alongside him in Antioch. An explosive revival broke out in that city and the rest, as they say, is history. By the time that that Paul reaches Greece, 25 years later, now he's picking up speed. It looks like he's going to make it on to Rome, but then all kinds of problems erupt in the church in Corinth. Divisions develop among the congregation. There's an outbreak of immorality. Infiltrators are trying to alienate the congregation from Paul's leadership. And here's the thing. Paul really, really wants to get to Rome. And then he wants to get on to Spain. But you see, there's all these unresolved problems. So Paul stays for four more years. And they weren't fun. He wrote the Corinthians three letters. And he made three visits. One of the letters he calls the painful letter. And believe me, it was a doozy. And then he he was so worried about the Corinthians. He was so worried about how they would receive that letter that he couldn't even minister while he was waiting for Titus to come back and bring him word of the Corinthians. But here's the point. Paul stayed at it until he could write to the Romans in good conscience, my work here is done now. He stayed at it until at-risk relationships were stabilized. He he stayed at it until grievances were addressed. He stayed at it until misunderstandings were resolved. He stayed at it until threats were removed. He stayed at it until he could say with confidence that the church in Corinth was on a good course for success. And beloved, we can take a lesson from Paul this morning. When things don't go as planned, when things have taken a lot longer than we thought, when the work has been a lot harder than we thought, when relationships are a lot trickier than we thought, when our enemies fight a lot dirtier than we thought, we we wish like David we could just fly away, but we can't. The key to our future success is found in sorting out our present problems and fulfilling our responsibilities. Do you know what the problem is with running away? The problem with running away is you take you with you. (laughs) You can run to a new relationship. You can run to a new career. You can run to a new city, a new church. You can find a new pastime. But the problem is you take you with you and you the problem. 
The reason that God wants you to stay and face problems is because God wants to fix you while you're fixing problems. God wants to make you stronger and wiser and more faithful and maybe a little more humble. It's a principle in God's kingdom. Jesus taught us. Jesus said, if you aren't faithful with what God has put in your hand today, then how can God give you more to handle tomorrow? But if you are faithful with what God has given you today, then God will trust you with more tomorrow. You see, because Paul had been faithful when things didn't go as planned, he was confident that when he finally did get to Rome, that God would pour out the full measure of the blessing of Christ. Because Paul could write to the Romans and say, my work here is done. I have finished what God gave me to do. He could also boldly say to them, I know that God is powerfully going to work when I get to you. What have we made that our goal to? Now listen, there are some toxic people and there are some toxic situations that we need to run away from. I'm not talking about that. It's another sermon for another day. But, but is there a responsibility in your life right now that you want to run away from? And God is saying to you, stay put until you can truly say, my work here is finished. So that when I finally do move on, I can move on with confidence and saying, I'm going forward in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. How do we hold on to hope when things don't go as planned? Number one, don't flee. Number two, when things don't go as planned, don't forsake your past commitments, nor forego showing gratitude or honor. Beloved, every once in a while in life, we have to go backwards in order to go forwards. We have to take care of some unfinished business from yesterday before we can jump into tomorrow. Paul is really eager to get to Rome. He's eager to go onward to Spain. But there's this trip he has to take to Jerusalem first. And it's not going to be an easy trip. Now, Paul is writing from Greece. He's about 700 miles away from Rome. Jerusalem is 1,000 miles in the other direction. So Paul has to travel 1,000 miles out of his way, and then he has to travel 1,700 miles back to Rome. And just to remind you of what travel was like in those days, it took him a year to get to Rome, and he almost didn't make it. And not only the travel time, but Paul is deeply worried about the reception waiting for him in Jerusalem. There were a lot of Jews who wanted to kill him, and there were a lot of Jewish Christians who just didn't like him. So why not just skip the trip? Why not just forget about Jerusalem and keep heading west? Well, for one thing, Paul was going to Jerusalem to fulfill a commitment. It's important to know that everything Paul did, he did under the covering of the Jerusalem apostles. Everything Paul did, he did with their knowledge. Everything he did, he did with their blessing. Everything he did, he did with their support and their prayer covering. Paul was not a lone ranger. He was accountable to the Jerusalem church. You see, even apostles need apostolic covering and accountability. And that's good right there. We have a little saying, some were called, some were sent, some bought a microphone and went. Paul was not in that third category. He was called by Christ and he was sent by the Jerusalem church. Before Paul embarked on the second missionary journey, the apostles in Jerusalem asked him, they said, we'll ask you, we're sending you with our blessing. We ask you one thing. Remember the poor in Jerusalem. Persecution and terrible famine and the support of many missionaries had depleted the funds of the Jerusalem Christians completely. So Paul made a commitment to help them. And he spent the next seven years working on the offering for the church in Jerusalem. Paul really wanted to get to Rome and then onward to Spain. But there was this commitment that he had made to the Lord and to the Lord's people. Paul was going to Jerusalem to deliver a debt of gratitude. 
You see, he owed everything to the Jerusalem church. He owed his eternal salvation to the Jerusalem church. It was their prayers. It was their courage under persecution. It was their passion for Christ. It was Stephen's intercession as Stephen was being stoned to death and Saul, a young man, was standing there holding the coats, giving approval to the death of Stephen. It was Stephen's prayer of intercession. Father, forgive them. That led to Saul's conversion. Paul owed his very life to the Jerusalem church. If they hadn't rescued him and sent him to Tarsus, the Jews would have killed him. He owed his whole ministry to the Jerusalem church. If Barnabas hadn't come looking for him and led him to Antioch, he would have never fulfilled his apostolic calling. All the believers in Syria and Turkey and in Greece who had come to Christ through Paul's ministry and even the believers in Rome owed their salvation to the Jerusalem church. You know, 2,000 years later, we're still indebted to them. And maybe we ought to remember to pay it forward. After two years, I'm so happy to see our flagpoles going back up again. We managed to get the American flag back up this last week. And this coming week, the Star of David's going up again over our campus. Paul really wanted to get to Rome and then onward to Spain. But you see, he owed this debt of gratitude. Paul was going to Jerusalem to shore up at-risk relationships. He could have very easily justified skipping a visit to Jerusalem. All of his problems came from Jerusalem. False apostles from Jerusalem had infiltrated his churches. They had smeared his name all over the ancient world and, and in Jerusalem. Paul was a persona non grata. The relationship between the uh, Gentile churches and the, the mother church in Jerusalem was at risk. That's why Paul had to go himself to make sure that the offering was received in the proper spirit, to make sure that it, it, it accomplished the purpose of unifying and healing for which it was taken. He, he really, really wanted to get to Rome and then onward to Spain, but there was this relationship that needed strengthening. And beloved, there's an important lesson here for us. When things don't go as planned, when things take a lot longer than we thought, when they're a lot harder than we thought, when relationships take an ugly turn, we can be tempted to walk away from the commitments we've made to the Lord and his people. Sorry, Lord, I can't keep that promise because this happened and that happened and I wasn't expecting that. We can be tempted to move on without showing gratitude or honor where it's due. We can be tempted to let go of relationships too easily and move on to the next thing. But Paul shows us that God doesn't want us to move on with our plans until we have kept our promises. Yes. That's good preaching right there. Yes. When we keep our commitments, we show that we are sons and daughters of a good, good father who has kept all of his. No matter how many promises God has made, all of them, all of them are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. God has kept every promise that he ever made. And when we keep our commitments, we show that we're like him. When we show gratitude and honor to whom it's due, we move forward in the fullness of their blessings. I want you to follow this with me this morning. Why go to Jerusalem first? Well, it's because Paul operated under the blessing of the Jerusalem church. And after he paid this debt of gratitude, after he showed honor where it was due, he was confident that when he went to Rome, he would go in the fullness of the blessings of Christ. Beloved, do you know when you bring your tithe to harvest time each week, you walk under the fullness of the blessings of this house. When you keep your commitments that you've made to giving to the building, you walk under the fullness of the blessing of this house. I want to tell you something. You can expect miracles. And listen, I don't say that because I'm the pastor here. I say that because God is faithful and we have had miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. When things haven't gone like you planned, when they've taken a lot longer than you thought, when it's been a lot harder than you thought, 
Go any distance you have to to keep your commitments. Go any distance you have to to pay a debt of gratitude or show honor where it's due. Go any distance you have to to mend at-risk relationships. You know, people, they won't understand. They'll say, you're all over the map. You're supposed to be going 700 miles west, Paul, and you're going 1,000 miles east. That's all right. You just let them talk. Sometimes you have to go back in order to go forward in the fullness of the blessings of Christ. How do we hold on to hope when things haven't gone as planned? Some principles from Romans 15. Don't flee from your problems. Don't forsake your commitments. Number three, don't forget to communicate with people who care about you and who can help you succeed. Paul couldn't get to Rome right away, but his letter could. It would take, from the time Paul wrote Romans 15, it took him four more years to finally get to Rome, but his letters got there in just a couple of weeks. He communicated with the Romans. He explained the reason for his delay. He worked on building a relationship with them. It would take Paul six more years to finally get to Spain, but he could still lay his plans today and enlist the help of the Romans. And once again, we can take a lesson here from Paul. Just because we can't do everything we planned right now doesn't mean we can't do anything. Just because the the timing hasn't worked out like we planned doesn't mean that we can't still use our time wisely right now. When Paul was delayed, he communicated. It's taken us just a little longer than we thought, but I'm still coming. It's taken a little more out of us than we thought, but we're still fighting the good fight. While Paul was detained in prison, he communicated. Paul was under house arrest in Rome for two years. He couldn't get to Spain, but he used that time to write the letters to the Philippians and the Ephesians and the Colossians and Philemon and First and Second Timothy and Titus. We have the book of Romans because Paul was detained in Corinth sorting out messes. You know, because of the ministry pace that Paul kept, one has to wonder if we would have eight or more books of the New Testament if Paul had not gone to jail. God had to lock him up so he could sit down and write. But I would listen to this. This is good right here. Sometimes the most valuable and lasting contributions of our life happen precisely because things didn't go like we planned. That's good right there. I just preach myself happy with that line. (laughs) If things haven't gone like you planned, communicate. Let people know you're still alive and kicking. Let people who care about you know about your inner struggles. Let the people who are counting on you know why you've been delayed. Let the people who can help you succeed know that you're still in it to win it. Let people know you're going to make it. You might not look like much when you get there, but you are going to make it. I feel like I have a word from the Holy Spirit for somebody today. Holy Spirit says it is time for you to come out of the cave. Things haven't turned out like you planned and you sort of turn inward. You've shut down a little bit and it's time for you to come out of the cave and start communicating with the people who care about you and the people who can help you. If that's words for you, receive it in Jesus' name. How do we hold on to hope when things don't go as planned? Don't flee your problems. Don't Forsake your commitments. Don't forget to communicate. Number four, when things don't go as planned, be flexible with your plans, but never with God's purpose. Be flexible with your plans, but never with God's purpose. Paul had to constantly adjust his plans. He had to adjust his timing. He had to adjust his itinerary, but his God-given purpose never changed. God has given me grace to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ is not known. That was Paul's purpose. Paul's purpose never changed, but his plans changed many times. And we can take a lesson from Paul. When things don't go as planned, change your plans, but hold on to God's purposes. And here's something we need to realize. While we're delayed, 
God is working out purposes of his own that we usually can't see at the time. Paul really wanted to get to Rome and then onward to Spain, but he was delayed for two years in prison in Israel. You know what happened during those two years? Paul had a traveling companion named Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke was bored while he was waiting for Paul to get out of jail, so he went around Israel interviewing eyewitnesses to the life and death and resurrection of Jesus and the birth of the church. And he compiled all those interviews into a two-volume work that we know as the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, which make up one quarter of the New Testament. Do you realize that we would be missing almost half of the New Testament if things hadn't gone as planned? Do you know we'd be missing almost half of our new building if things hadn't gone as planned? In 1997, we set out to build a permanent home for harvest time, a place big enough to hold a congregation of a thousand people. God led us to this property and we designed the building you're in and also the building that's going up next door. But along the way, we had to adjust our plans several times. We had to adjust the timing. We had to adjust the execution. Originally, we were going to build the whole thing at once, but we just couldn't afford to do it. So we adjusted our plans, and we built it in two halves. I have to tell you the truth. For a couple of years after we moved into this building, I wondered if I had failed the Lord. I wondered if I, if I had failed to have enough faith to do the whole thing at once. But, you know, during the delay, the Lord worked in our favor. The zoning laws in Greenwich changed, and we were able to add a basement under both halves of this building. That was space that we weren't originally planning to build, but God knew we would need it. We started raising money to build phase two in 2008, right when the Great Recession began. We couldn't start the building then, but we could put in two out of the three new parking lots we would need. We hadn't done that. We couldn't have kept growing in this building, and it would have been a mess when we finally did get around to construction. See, God knew what we needed before we did, and our delays turned out to be for his great purposes. On Thursday, we finally took delivery of the glass for our windows and doors in our new building. We've been delayed for seven months on the doors and the windows. We really wanted to go with an installer from Pennsylvania because his bid was $200,000 lower than any other bid. $200,000, that's a lot of money, y'all. That's a lot of money. But the lovely state of Connecticut has some requirements that, that no other state around here has, and this guy from Pennsylvania needed some stuff from the state, and we were waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for him to get it. Finally, he contacted us a few weeks back and he said, you know, it's just not going to happen. I just can't get what I need. So now we're back to square one. However, in the intervening time during the delay, Tim, our construction manager and our architect set about to value engineering all the windows and doors. The architect designed the windows in the new building. Every piece of glass was a custom size. And so we just made a few tweaks and changed it from custom size to standard sizes. And we went to a local installer, someone with an excellent reputation. He's doing all the car dealerships on the post road in Greenwich right now. We, we approached him at the outset of the project, and he didn't want to put in a bid because he had way too much work at the time. But when the guy from Pennsylvania said, you know, I can't do the job, we went back to him and said, would you consider bidding? And he said, yeah, I'll bid. And because of the work that we did, he gave us a price that was $60,000 lower than the guy from Pennsylvania. So we're not only saving $200,000, we're saving $260,000 on our doors and windows. We're gonna start next week putting in the doors and the windows. Beloved, someone listen to me this morning. Someone receive a word from the Lord this morning. If things haven't gone as planned, take heart. God is for you and he is working all things together for your good and his glory. And we know this, that all things work together for good for those who love God 
and are called according to his purpose. How do we hold on to hope when things don't go as planned? A few principles from Romans 15. Don't flee your problems. Don't forsake your commitments. Don't forget to communicate. Be flexible with your plans. And finally, when things don't go as planned, never ever forget the awesome power of prayer. <laughs> Beloved, when things don't go as planned, remember that we are not without help. We are not without hope. We are not without recourse. We have the powerful resource of prayer. Paul pleads with the Romans. Hey, he says, wrestle in prayer with me. Fight in prayer. Contend in prayer with me. Stand in prayer with me. Pray that I'll be rescued from those who don't believe the gospel in Jerusalem. You might look at the way the story went down and say, well, the prayer didn't work. Paul was mobbed, he was arrested, and he was imprisoned for two years. But I look at this story the way it played out, and I say, what would have happened if they hadn't prayed? He was rescued from death in the nick of time. He was protected by the Romans until he left Israel. He preached the gospel to the Sanhedrin, to two governors, to a regional king. Luke wrote a quarter of the New Testament. And then Paul got a military escort and a free ride to Rome, where he preached the gospel to the entire Praetorian Guard and to Caesar's own household. Prayer changes things. Prayer makes a difference. Prayer brings about miracles. Twice during that whole ordeal because people were praying for Paul. The Lord visited Paul at night and he said, don't be afraid, Paul. You will reach Rome. Paul did reach Rome. And when he arrived, he arrived in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. And the Bible doesn't tell us, but church history tells us that Paul did make it all the way to Spain and he took the name of Jesus all the way to the ends of the earth where it had never been heard. And I want to leave you with the same word of encouragement this morning. Don't you dare let go of hope when things haven't gone as planned. Don't flee from your problems. Don't forsake your commitments. Don't forget to communicate. Be flexible with your plans. And don't forget the awesome power of prayer. Don't be afraid. You will reach Rome and beyond for the glory of God. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place this morning?